name is Peter Crone, commonly known as the Mind Architect, and I help people to transcend the deep constraints of the subconscious and discover a world of freedom. Welcome to the Fitness and Lifestyle Podcast. I'm your host, Danny Kennedy, and I'm here to help you become the very best version of yourself. Peter, welcome to the Fitness and Lifestyle Podcast, mate. It is an absolute pleasure to be sitting and having a conversation with you. Um, firstly, just wanted to express my gratitude for your time and and for you sharing your wisdom and knowledge with the audience, which I'm sure everyone is going to get a hell of a lot out of it. So thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Good to be here. Mate, the three words I don't know, um, they seem to be a very pivotal moment for you in your life. Are you able to explain to the the listeners of the show as to why those three words um, gave you this sense of freedom and kind of exposed you to the the power of energetics and, and what was truly possible for you in terms of, of having that feeling of freedom? Sure. Um, they occurred to me at a time in my life where I'd gone through a breakup with somebody and as is the nature of the survival part of us, my mind was trying to figure out Basically, if I was going to be okay moving forward, was I going to see this girl again? Would I have love like that again? And there was this sort of incessant talk track, which tends to be the inherent nature of the monkey mind that people have, where we're fundamentally just worried about our own existence. And uh, those three letters, three words came to me because I realized that the actual truth uh, the answer to all of those questions was that I don't know. I don't know in this case uh, if I would see this girl again. I didn't know if she was with somebody else already. I didn't know um, if I would find love like that again. And so all of the questions that were the genesis of my own suffering um, suddenly became moot. You know, I realized, well, um, the actual truth to the answer of the questions that were keeping me up at night, figuratively and literally, was simply the nature of life itself, which is uncertainty. And for the first time in my life, um, subjectively, once I saw that, I realized that I've never known, but because as a human being, our brain is designed to predict and protect, I was always trying to work it out, right? What people might call control issues or this incessant need to know what's going to happen, which is really a way of trying to garner a sense of security. And so once I saw that, um, that that's just the nature of life. I couldn't deny the truth of my own revelation. And so there was just this immense amount of liberation that happened where I didn't need to know. And, and it didn't matter if I tried, I just still didn't. And so the truth um, in that stage of my life was uh, true emancipation of the part of me that was trying to survive. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, I've heard you often refer to that kind of story within podcast interviews and whatnot around how post that realization, you had this energetic kind of freedom, I guess the word would be, but also kind of you opened yourself up to actually allow yourself to attract these things into your life that you were, you know, that you wanted, but beforehand you were kind of, you had this guard up or that you weren't energetically available for these things to be received. Like, for yeah. someone that's listening or watching at the moment, like how does that kind of play out in day-to-day -day life? So for someone who has had this narrative or a story that's been conditioned within them since maybe they're a child or a traumatic event that has happened to them, which has then led to them, you know, basing their whole life off a bunch of actions or, or mechanisms to protect themselves. Are you able to explain a little to help the listeners understand as to how they're not energetic, uh, energetically allowing themselves to attract the things that they say they want? Yeah, sure. I mean, that part of them that may be preoccupied, trying to survive, trying to figure it out, not necessarily available to both the potential of themselves internally, but also the abundance of life externally. It's really the identity, how we perceive ourselves, like what we might call our personality, mm -hmm. which gives rise to this personal reality that we call our life. The main issue with that is that the foundation of the identity or what I just call the ego is based in limitation, right? So some of them in the buckets of inadequacy, some sense of insecurity, some sense of scarcity. And so the idea of who people think they are is by design limited. And so it acts as this invisible barrier 
to both internal potential but external um, performance, right? So, and performance is a broad word, but it could mean your ability to perform in work, in skill, in sports, in relationships, whatever it might be. So, that aspect of a human being by default, by design, is constrained. And so that's what I'm helping people to transcend is to discover this world of complete freedom on the other side of this identity that we become misidentified with. Most people think they're this meat suit and all of their thoughts and beliefs, and there's nothing inherently wrong with that. It's just a very limited and small way of understanding ourselves versus the bigger self, capital S, which we could use the term spirit or soul or consciousness to point mm -hmm. to which is that you're a boundless, timeless being, but we collapse that with this idea of ourselves based on how we raised, the way we've been conditioned, uh, the trials and tribulations we've gone through, the hurts and disappointments we've experienced that accumulate to create this person that we think we are. Mm -hmm. And then that ironically becomes a very obstacle that we're looking to try and overcome. But nobody wants to get rid of themselves, right? So yeah. that's why it's... Uh, sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy, that self-sabotage that people, you know, often talk about in different arenas of their lives is an extension of the fact that who they are for themselves is limited. And so even on the precipice of great success, a better job, a wonderful relationship, whatever it is that we might crave, the sabotage is really that identity that its main preoccupation is to be right about its own limitation. Right. I guess what comes with that, particularly when people start to, I guess, identify these these blocks or the the conditioning that's causing them to behave in certain ways, self sabotage and whatnot, also requires a level of strength or, in particular, responsibility in terms of taking responsibility for their own actions, the things that are within their control, and the choices that they have made, which is quite which is difficult at times. And, you know, I've heard you refer to it once as, you know, in order to grow and, you know, as a personal trainer myself and fitness coach, I can relate to this, that in order to grow, you need to lift heavy shit. Yeah. So the second part of that, once that identification has happened, is then being able to sit with that discomfort and, and go through the those tough times and know that coming out on the other side that there is growth there. Like, is that something you see quite often, people coming to the realisation that there are things that are blocking them but then not being able to sit with that discomfort to, to come out on the other side of it? Yeah, for sure, because I think one of the biggest obstacles is not just the limitations themselves, which can be incredibly suffocating, but the fact that the design of the ego is that it wants to be right about its own perspective, right? You look at any relationships, whether it be intimate, romantic, family, uh, international, between religions, the predominant undercurrent of most people's upset or disagreements is always based in the fact that somebody wants to be right. And if you have two people who want to be right, that means you're both by extension wanting to make the other person wrong. And so now you're in this argument or disagreement. This is when people fight um, emotionally, certainly. So really that's one of the biggest challenges is that the foundation of the identity, which is based in as I said, inadequacy, insecurity, scarcity, even though that's what we're here to transcend and to mitigate, to find freedom, its, it's nature is to want to protect itself. When people get into arguments, if you were to judge somebody, most people's reaction is going to be, screw you, or no, I'm not, or I'm going to do whatever I want, right? So it's not, there's no listening, it's just a reaction. So the, the biggest struggle is, yes, the constraints themselves, for sure, are one aspect of the obstacle, but the other more insidious and slippery part of that is that who we identify ourselves with is constantly wanting to sustain itself by being self-righteous. So that that's where a lot of people fall short is that they can see that maybe for years they felt they're not enough. And that's obviously wonderful to notice and have awareness around and it can certainly breed a little bit of freedom. But if you don't get beyond that part of you that feels it's not enough, wanting to find evidence that it's not enough, right? Someone gets fired or their girlfriend, boyfriend breaks up with them. It's like, oh, see, I told you I'm not enough. So there's always the opportunity for the ego to find whatever ammunition it needs to justify its own existence. And that really is the biggest, I feel, challenge for somebody who wants to transcend their ego is to 
kind of almost notice that that's the pattern and make space for it. You don't have to fight it. A lot of people are like, oh, get rid of the ego. And that, that equally is, to me, an, an extension of the ego. Uh, really, the ego wants to be held like a child that feels inadequate. So, yeah, it, it's, you know, my work isn't for the faint of heart, but it's the most rewarding aspect of being human and i would assert why we're all here which is to discover true inner freedom and peace i love that and i feel like so many people and and you know feel free to reframe this if i'm not saying it correctly but so many people give their power to other people or to other circumstances every single day when and when you look at it with some perspective it's actually fucking insane when you think about driving in traffic getting cut off by someone who you've probably mm -hmm. never met before and you don't know their circumstances but that one thing triggers a completely shit day full of negativity and one thing leads to the other and you manifest more shit yeah like what are some simple things that that people can start to work on in order to i guess is it dr to drop the ego and to just become more more present or is it what are some things that people can do in order to get out of that pattern i think the first thing is awareness right to notice where those triggers happen when you get upset at a coworker, a boss, a spouse, a family member, a sibling, as you said, a stranger in traffic. It's really the opportunity for somebody to see where they're saying, albeit unconsciously, I'm not okay with what just happened, right? Mm. So that is that victim mindset. But when people really look at it, it starts to at least uh, invite a little bit of inquiry as to well wait a minute is that true that like my life is in danger or i'm threatened because someone cut me off or my wife said da 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 no you start to realize the the insanity of the fact that people are so easily upset they're basically in reaction to circumstances what it looks like but what it's actually revealing at a deeper level is they're in reaction to their own perspective of how they think life should be so that's the fundamental lie is yeah. that the audacity of the ego is, you know, I know how people should act or I know how life should unfold. And when you really look at it that way and understand that that is the precursor to upset, you're, you, you can't help but laugh at just the nonsensical nature that we think we know how everybody in the universe should be behaving. Mm. Right, it, it's it's sort of preposterous when you really look at it. Yeah. It's like, well, who the hell gave you the keys to the universe? I didn't get the memo that you're in charge of how everybody should behave. Right, so yeah. when you just look at it that way, it gives them reprieve, and people can kind of, you know, chuckle at their own insanity that they're upset at what a coworker did or someone in traffic or whatever. It's like really, like okay, like you're you're in charge of everybody's like choices it's 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 nonsensical so then you start to at least find some freedom and realize oh okay what's what is it in me at a deeper level that is being actually triggered right somebody cutting you off in traffic is not the cause of somebody's frustration that's just what happened right the cause of what creates frustration anger a reaction flicking the bird to somebody is that you already have a degree of unrest, hostility, dissatisfaction, unhappiness within you. And that was sort of just the quote unquote straw that broke the camel's back to help release it. Mm -hmm. So if anything, that person did you a favor because you're not carrying some of that suppressed emotion, it gets expressed a little bit. Um, and that's, that's real where the gold is to have that inquiry as to what am I saying about this incident that caused me to have a reaction at a deeper level mm -hmm. and if i can discover that then you know i have the access to finding some freedom and peace of mind where i'm no longer at the effect of what happens around me yeah so that frustration and the the anger that comes out is almost like the symptom of of the root cause correct yeah i mean because right. someone cuts you off in traffic maybe the choice in terms of responsibility is you're running late for a meeting and you're feeling stressed and you mm -hmm. interpret that event as potentially adding to the stress of you being late mm -hmm. versus let's say you go to the airport and someone's taking forever to get through TSA or to check in. But if you're there two hours early versus 45 minutes before your flight, you have a different 
feeling about this illusion of time, right? That's what's creating people's stress. Mm. So it always comes back to ourselves and where can we own and be accountable for our own reactions. Now, most people don't want to have that. It's much easier to point a finger and blame, right? But what people don't understand is in that interaction of blame or judgment of another one, another human, another one's uh, behaviors, you're actually saying I'm powerless. You're, You're unconsciously granting somebody the illusion of they have some say in your emotional state. Mm. Right. If you really break it down, then then you really go, whoa, I'm handing my power out to everybody like they control how I feel. Yeah. Which is another way for people to go, well, that's kind of dumb. First of all, it's not actually what's happening, even though that's the illusion that people think is happening. That's not the truth. Nobody upset you because oh, I'm really angry because so and so. No, you're really angry because you're choosing, you are choosing, albeit at a subconscious level, to generate an experience, an emotional reaction to what someone did. They didn't make you angry. Like, you know, they don't have the puppet strings to your emotional well being. Yeah. So when you see that, it's like, oh, well, that kind of makes a lot of sense. So then maybe you start to get this glimmer of power in terms of your own emotional well being. And that's for most people is, you know, a that's a nice feeling of empowerment and responsibility otherwise i'm just bouncing around life like a ping ball um pinball you know where somebody says something something happens i'm upset i'm happy i'm yeah. pissed i'm angry i'm whatever it's like it's exhausting <laughs> yeah fucking nice. the the time illusion that's something that i've really enjoyed hearing you talk about or or more so, um, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but the psychological time illusion. So, you know, yeah. you're spending a lot of time psychologically in the past, which is then causing reactions or spending time yeah. thinking of future events which haven't even happened yet, which is also causing stress or, or depression in terms of the the past situations and whatnot. Like, yeah. are you able to go into a little bit of detail on that in terms of what you mean by that? Sure. Um you know, it's part of the human experience We're it's, you know, like even Einstein said, you know, past, present and future are persistent illusions, right? So there's no actual thing as a past and there's no actual thing called a future. What we have is a perpetual state of presence. And then on top of that, we in language have the narratives that are past based or future based, but it's all occurring now. Mm -hmm. So I could, in my mind, as I'm talking to you, my mind could drift into, oh, shit, I've got to do something by tomorrow. And that would, first of all, disengage me from the moment. So now I'm not fully present, which is what most people do entirely through their life in their relationships and their performance. This is something I help athletes understand. Mm -hmm. If they're trying to perform, the best and only place they can do that is being fully present where they are. Yeah. But the mind, because especially the ego is based in psychological time, it has a history and it has a perceived future, but all of that only exists in linguistics. So when you understand that your future occurs now and your, your past occurs now, it's quite, for most people, it's actually quite shocking because they really think, you know, the things they want are in the future and the things that they regret are in their past. No, they're with them right now on both sides of the spectrum. So it's it's a little bit of a mind fuck, but it's a very powerful thing to understand that everything you're experiencing has to occur in present time. It's just to what degree are you engaged with your senses, with your current reality, or are you engaged with and giving attention to your thoughts and images of your mind, which are based in illusion of time? When we're in our minds, people can call it daydreaming or fantasizing or imagining. And at times that's appropriate, right? If somebody is walking into a new building where they're going to start a business, an office, or it's a new home where they're going to envisage how they're going to lay it out with furniture. You know, we use the power of imagination and creativity to envisage something we're stepping into. But most people use that faculty of the mind as a means of worrying about a future which is imagined, and then Mm -hmm. in present time trying to avoid the future that they just imagined. 
You know, you just start yeah. to see how absolutely yeah. futile that is, right? It's one brain creates a future of worst case scenario. And then the one brain that imagined that future that's an illusion is now trying to think of methods of avoiding that made up future. <laughs> and then yeah. again, you wonder why people are exhausted, need medication or alcohol. So that's, that's the illusion of time. There's chronological time. You know, the sun yeah. is at the center of the universe. We, we say the sun rises and sets, but it doesn't. Um, but that 24 hours is a consistent linear time. And we are in progression with that. And the degree to which we're in harmony with chronological time is the degree that we are present. We can drift into our minds, but we're not drifting in time. We're drifting into perception of memories or yeah. imagination. Yeah, that's really fucking cool. I like that. And I, I feel like the, the listeners and the viewers will take a lot out of that piece in particular. Yeah, and if like, you're uh, in a real life situation, not to interrupt, but like when yeah. people struggle with fear and anxiety, this mm -hmm. is why it's so powerful to understand the fear and anxiety that they have occurs to them as though it's something in the future they're worried about, right? Mm -hmm. But when they get, no, 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 your future happens now. So you're having your fear and anxiety now because you're having the thought now over something that hasn't even happened yet. You're literally making up your own anxiety, which is so powerful, right? Yeah. Because if you really get that, you're no longer a victim of a potential worst case scenario that you think is out of your grasp or your control. No, you're literally generating your own emotions right now based on the lens that you're looking through. Equally, on the flip side of the same coin, you could say there's excitement. Excitement you're generating based, again, on a future proposition that hasn't happened yet, but it's a better case scenario or something you're, quote, unquote, looking forward to. Mm -hmm. But that equally is an unknown. You Going back to the three words, I don't know what the fuck's going to happen, right? So that I don't know is the access to freedom. We can have intention. You know, I'm prolifically creative. I'm building a lot of things, writing books, mm -hmm. doing businesses. But I don't know to what degree they're going to happen, will be fulfilled, or on what timeline. I can have, you know, a degree of commitment to something. Someone might say, I want to lose 20 pounds, and I'm going to do it in three months. So now they've created an intention with a timeline, which is the most powerful way to do it. But now they come back to present time, they use that created future as inspiration for the actions that they take. So if people want to generate a new life or a future that they're inspired by, then right. yes, you use your imagination, you foresee it, you have a realistic timeline, and then you take actions to fulfill on that. But emotionally, to be powerful about it, it's living from that future already fulfilled, right? So yeah. if using yep. the very common, I want to lose weight, which in itself in language is a very powerless way to say it, but let's yes. say someone's 160 pounds and they want to be 140, then how would they feel? What, why, what's the intention? Well, I'd feel healthier, I'd feel lighter, I'd feel more confident. Okay, great, we'll embody those qualities now Yep. And then they are the the stimulus or the inspiration for you to take actions that will automatically lead to that outcome that would be commensurate with the person who yep. is 140 pounds, you see. Whereas yeah. most people perpetually push their future away because they think, well, I'm going to be happy when I make more money, mm -hmm. which is saying I'm not happy now. That emotion of not happiness, unfulfilled, maybe even depression or resigned, uh, cynicism isn't a motivator to make money or to feel wa valued or to feel inspired to pursue your passions or your businesses, right? So most people are living the other way around. Uh, they're living yeah. from a history with evidence of why shit's not going to work for them, yeah. which only perpetuates that sort of malaise. And I'm saying, no, if you live from a future fulfilled, how would you feel? Like, well, fuck, that'd be awesome. Okay, great. We'll be awesome. And then that's what you will create. Yeah. That's so powerful. That's so powerful. And when you, when you look at how many people are living in that uh, state of, you know, you refer to it as dis-ease and yeah. uh, it's things that are, are causing stress, it's the reactions, it's the living in the future that hasn't happened yet because you're not in the now and whatnot. Yeah. Um, you know, you often talk about how that is what over time accumulates to actual physical disease. Correct. Um, 
are you able to i mean i i kind of understand that um but yeah. for the listener that that can't kind of put that together uh, are you able to kind of just go into a little bit of detail physiologically about how that kind of makes sense sure yeah so you know depending on what age someone is when we're younger we have sort of better buffers we have more um capacity to heal and so you know when you're younger usually also you're in an environment hopefully where the majority of your needs are met, right? You have a roof over your house, your parents yeah. provide food and security. But then as we go through into that adult phase and now we're on our own, we feel it's incumbent upon us to survive, we get that very common state of stress, which is sort of a, a generalized expression for we are in a mild to sometimes severe state of fight or flight, which is I'm trying to survive. I'm trying to make rent. You know, I, I feel the pressure to uh, make my parents proud or to fulfill on a vision that my dad wanted me to be a lawyer or a doctor or whatever it is. And that creates this angst and stress, which is the absence of absence of ease, right? So mm -hmm. that's this ease. So it always starts uh, psychologically and emotionally. So basically our nervous system, which is the way that we relate to life, is creating an internal terrain that is hostile. Yeah. So we're not feeling secure, held, reassured, at peace. And so what happens is when we are in sympathetic mode, which is to common vernacular fight or flight, which people yeah. would have heard. And again, it's a gradient, right? Like in terror and panic, you're literally fighting for your life or that's how it occurs. There might not be someone trying to stab you or there might not be a bear chasing you. But the feeling of the pressure of you might get fired or let go from work and you don't know how you're going to pay your mortgage can simulate the same feeling of terror. Now, when the body is in that state of fight or flight, which is a necessary faculty of being human, it's helpful at times, right? If God forbid you are in a bar brawl or you need to look out for yourself or you need to protect your kids or whatever it is, that's helpful to have. But when it's a consistent chronic state, then the body literally can't do any repair because you're dumping adrenaline, norepinephrine, cortisol into the system, mm. which has a cascade effect. So one of the side effects of being in fight or flight is there's no need to properly digest food, right? Digesting food, you know, having had a beautiful freaking yogurt and fruit and like this beautiful sundae or whatever you had for breakfast, the body's like, okay, I don't have time to fully metabolize and digest mm. that because the brain is telling me that we're in a threatening situation, which again, we're calling stress. So now what happens is our body, our physiology is dependent on nutrients, right? And the way that we obviously sleep, yeah. we heal, we nourish ourselves, and we get rid of waste matter and all of the things that sustain our vitality. So if the predominant way that we heal, which is through the foods that we ingest and equally mentally the things that we ingest, is turned off because our brain is saying we're in fight or flight, then you don't have to be a rocket scientist to recognize that eventually you're going to have a deleterious effect on your ability to um, replenish tissues and to have vital cell replication so that you can maintain the quality of your own physiology, right? So if you're yeah. in a constant state of stress, you don't digest, your sleep is going to be impaired, your cell replication and rejuvenation is also impaired. So yeah, if you're robust and you're built like a brick shit house and an ox, then fine, you might get away with it for a while. If you have a more fragile constitution, then symptoms of sickness and disease are going to manifest quicker. And this to me is what we see over time is that cascade of living chronically to varying degrees in a state of fight or flight because the brain is telling you that life is dangerous or you're in a position of threat because you don't feel like you're enough or you're not going to be okay. Then eventually it is just physics that your body has to show the wear and tear of not being given sufficient time rest and peace to heal itself and so yeah. that is you know why i'm so passionate about health because yeah you know i work with a lot of people who have plenty of resources they might even have their own personal trainers they might have chefs they can buy 
good quality organic food. They live in a nice home that's safe in a nice neighborhood. There's nothing really for them to quote unquote worry about. But because of these deep seated constraints of fear and inadequacy and security, they're not enough, whatever it is, they're in a mild state of self consciousness as it relates to what do other people think about me? Am I going to be okay? Am I keeping up with the Joneses? And so they have externally all the trappings, but internally they're at war with themselves. And that will eventually manifest in obviously the myriad of different sicknesses that people experience. So hopefully yeah. that helps people understand. <laughs> 100%. Yeah, I think it's a big, big wake up call for a lot of people. And, and sometimes just hearing it or seeing it like that kind of allows people to really get a grasp of, of how important it is to work through these things. And, you know, my producer Kane and I were talking before the show. Um, we're both big sport fans, basketball, combat sports, all that type of stuff. And yeah, Kane had a really good question that I wanted to throw at you. So, cool. so for someone like uh, Mike Tyson, right? So he has a pretty rough childhood, um, grows up in, in an environment which is quite stressful and there's a lot of trauma and whatnot. And, and obviously in the, the middle parts of his life at this point anyway, is, there's a lot of, uh, you know, getting locked up there's there's the um the all the stuff that he gets in trouble for and and it kind of all kind of shows itself in terms of the trauma that he's been through and the conditioning as a child like if you were to work with mike tyson before all this bad shit kind of happened in his life in terms of him acting out and whatnot what are some of the things that you would have done in order to hopefully prevent a lot of the negative stuff that has happened throughout mike tyson's life I mean, it's all hypothetical. So, you know, I uh, just want to speak to that first. Um, when you look at someone like that, it's not, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that he is quite literally a fighter. Yeah. So fighting as a physiological response is a mechanism. It's a maladaptive way that the person is trying to survive a perceived threatening environment mm -hmm. so in his case it gave him a career right but at what expense all the drama all you know the misdemeanors god knows what in relationships loss of finances loss of cognitive health you know he's obviously taken a few punches and yeah whatever drugs he's done so his internal terrain is literally he's at war now when somebody is scared and they are a fighter, they are equally dangerous. Now, you put them in a ring with somebody else versus me, I probably wouldn't stand a chance. I mean, I'm pretty adept. I'm a good athlete, but I'm more likely to win a fight out of helping somebody discover their own love, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, that's more my methodology. I've never been in a fight my whole life. So with someone like that, he would have to see that his environment that he grew up with, with trauma and all of the hardship he went through as a kid, mm -hmm. the absence of love, love, the absence of recognition, acknowledgement and value is what left him literally in a state of perpetual survival. And so anybody who's on the streets in the ring doing UFC is usually the, the, you know, they are the byproduct of a very hostile environment as a child. And that's the way they learn to survive. But anytime you're fighting or even resisting life, you are in a state of deleterious cost to your own vitality and well being. Yeah. It might serve a purpose. You might become the bully in high school for a minute because you're bigger and you've learned to be a tough guy, but only because you're having to sustain that abusive environment at home. But at the end of the day, it's always going to be at your own loss yeah. because you can't sustain that. You can't be in a perpetual state of fighting life mm -hmm. without there being some really um, deleterious impact, you know, that's, that's just – sad honestly for most people yeah and i guess always in a constant state of feeling like you need to seek validation through your actions instead of just being able to accept or or give love naturally without having to do something for it in that case yeah that too and that could be sort of like the slightly less invasive version of fighting right where maybe a kid isn't in a hostile environment they weren't hit they weren't disciplined but maybe they weren't noticed or acknowledged. And so mm -hmm. they felt that whatever they did was never sufficient, which can breed that mindset of not enoughness. 
And so there can be this constant striving to prove oneself, which itself is also exhausting, right? Yeah. So ultimately, at the end of the day, you're always battling your own perception of yourself. Mm-hmm. And so it's never the demon out there. It's always the way that we are relating to ourselves, which is a blind spot. This is why there's compassion. You know, people are literally oblivious to that which they're oblivious to, right? So you can't have judgment. Somebody knows, for example, they shouldn't smoke cigarettes in this day and age, but they're still addicted, whether it's now predominantly physiologically, but before it was because they had so much angst and anxiety that they needed that nicotine to just get some relief, but they don't know why they really struggle with anxiety and feeling uncomfortable in Mm. their own skin. So they know consciously that they shouldn't smoke, but they don't know what at the subconscious level created that habit. Well, because they're scared, they feel hurt. And they don't know the story around that, that no one loves me, I'm worthless, right? And if Mm. you live inside of that mental prison, then you are going to feel the ramifications of that and seek relief however you can. Nicotine, weed, alcohol, food, sex, whatever it is. So that's where I think with this work, I always start with a lot of compassion that people are doing the best they can within the level of awareness that they have. So Mike Tyson was one of those people who's blind to his own deep-seated constraints, just learned to survive and literally fend for himself, albeit with great cost. He carved out a career, fine, he made some money, but to what degree is that a fulfilling, purpose-filled life? I mean, he's maturing now. Maybe he's starting to see some of the you know underlying currents that drove that, and yeah. he's finding love and peace and acceptance. But yeah, I mean, this is how most people live their life, right? They are in a constant state of fight or flight to whatever degree. Before we move on, because I, I really want to uh, get you to explain this example of um, of an athlete in particular that you've that you've worked with um, that I found is super interesting. But just before I move on to that, um, to wrap up this part, so for someone that does have that trauma or that conditioning, someone like a Mike Tyson or whatever, and or in any, they might be a CEO, they could be whoever the fuck it is, and they start to see this level of success and they start to get money and they start to materialistically see benefit of you know yeah. expressing whatever it may be. How difficult is it for someone like that to then take that step back and actually work through the, the trauma and the conditioning to, to realize that maybe what they've just made a living off, even though it's come off the back of trauma or conditioning, is not actually helping them in the long run? If that makes any sense. Yeah, no, it does. And it depends on the individual, right? It's like it's hard to answer specifically, but it depends on where does somebody put the emphasis of success? When somebody comes from a traumatic background where there might have been a lot of poverty or scarcity, and they've learned through albeit maladaptive ways to cope as a fighter in life, maybe to the degree that some people cheat, they lie, they cut corners just to make it. And they start to garner the trappings of that behavior where they can buy the fancy car, they can throw money around at a strip joint, they get the women or or the guys if it's a girl doing it, or they feel this sense of internal worth based on their external superficial success. Mm -hmm. That can be very hard to undo because they're collapsing power, status, and value with what they've accumulated. But to me, then that's when you see people go into depression, midlife crisis, when usually around that age of 30, could be maybe 40, depending on the sport, you retire. And so now where all of that value was associated in terms of your recognition, you're a professional athlete, you go into this feeling of worthlessness again which never went anywhere, was always underneath the surface, Mm -hmm. but it was mitigated or hidden by virtue of the external illusion of success. So that can oftentimes be the comeuppance of somebody where they're like, okay, shit, now that I have done all of this, but I still feel empty. I mean, David Duval in golf, he won the British Open and went into severe depression. Because even though that was something he had aspired to, he realized, oh, but now what, right? Like that didn't complete him, right? So so it is up to the individual at what time they have usually 
some kind of crisis. You know, that sadly what most people need is they need to have that dark night of the soul before they re evaluate what is real success. And to me, you know, real success is to be totally at peace. Now, the yeah. irony is when you're totally at peace internally, you tend to be somebody who attracts the external trappings. So you, you can have it all. But if you get the trappings without the internal peace at some point, whether it's this lifetime, the next, or if you want to get poetic about it, you, you have to face the music that that's not success. It's, it's a facade mm -hmm. that can, you know, sustain internal lack for a while, but it's, it's no, it, it can't be, it's not perpetual, right? It's, it doesn't fulfill the whole. Like that's why one of the most prevalent words in marketing is more, right? Like if you're watching an infomercial and they're like, wait, there's more. Right. If you're the first 500 callers, you'll get the free fucking toaster or whatever it is. Like more is like that ultimate temptation for the ego, which is based in lack. Yeah. But it's the ultimate void that can't be fulfilled. Yeah. That's, uh, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Um, sure. A certain basketball player that you worked with um, had a fucking horrendous free throw percentage um, in terms of the average in the league. Um, yeah. And, you know, I remember hearing you talk about the process you worked through in terms of helping him get out of his own head and, and come back to that present moment and stop, you know, shooting yeah. his free throws based off past results and whatnot. Um, yeah. Are you able to just quickly explain, I guess, how, how that process plays out, whether it be for a basketball athlete or a golfer or, or for whatever it may be, um, someone who has sure. either had success and, and in a bit of a slump or someone who is just kind of far too deep in their own in their own consciousness to that is affecting their present uh, performance? Yeah, it's that self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So one of my quotes, I say, past hurt informs future fear. So in this case with this athlete or any athlete who's had a series of what they will interpret as failures, disappointments, then it's only natural that we are concerned for the continuation or repetition of that. Mm -hmm. right? So it doesn't have to be sports. Anyone can look at, okay, they had a bad breakup and then they had another bad breakup. Going into that next relationship, there is by nature of being human – no one's going to begrudge them the concern that, well, uh, this is this person going to be a bad breakup too? Yeah. So we tend to live our life kind of looking over our shoulder. Now, for an athlete, that's kryptonite, right? Because as I said earlier, the only place an athlete has power to perform is in the present moment. But if much of that athlete's attention is based on past failures, then you're already compromised in your ability to perform now because you're not using all of your faculties. Let's say, as every human being has to within their capacity, 100% ability to be present, right? And that might vary. Someone's presence might be a little bit compromised versus someone's, uh, someone else's presence. Mm -hmm. But 100% presence is the greatest precursor to at least you having the best outcome possible for you, right? But if an athlete is 50% present, because they've got 40% on their history that hurt and now 10% for the concern of the future of that being fulfilled again, they're operating literally at half of their capacity, which is that self-fulfilling prophecy. So yeah. with this particular athlete, I helped him understand the futility of that mechanism of trying to survive, which is really the little child who doesn't want to disappoint. In his case, earning millions of dollars, millions of fans watching, a lot at stake. His performance was oftentimes the differential in a win or a loss, right? Yep. If he was at the free throw line 10 times and he missed eight of those and only made two, but they lost the game by three points, mm -hmm. him even just getting four more would have meant winning by one, right? So, and that's not a crazy average to get six out of 10. That's still below average, yep. but it would have been the difference. So then there's a lot of guilt. There's a lot of shame. There's a lot of embarrassment. So we had to incorporate his history and find profound acceptance for he has to this point done what he's done. Mm -hmm. Now, when people have histories that are littered with trials, tribulations, disappointments, and failures, they end up trying to fix their history, which means they're constantly living in it. 
So I often make the joke of like Men in Black when, you know, Will Smith and um, what's his name? Tom, what's his name? I can't remember the actor's name, but, um, you know, they to, sorry, what's that? Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones, yeah. So whenever they would wave that block, that black wand in someone, someone's face after they'd seen the aliens, they, they had no memory of that. So yeah. the joke that I say with people, especially my athletes, is giving them the conscious form of m memory loss, right? So it's like a form of Alzheimer's, not to belittle or make fun of that disease. It's awful. But, you know, where there's no sense of history anymore, yeah. So you're not you're no longer being defined by what happened. You're just, well, I'm here and I don't know what's gonna happen. So it's that combination of the I don't know. Am I gonna go nine for ten from the free throw line or I'm gonna go zero from ten? The, all those possibilities exist in the quantum yeah. field, but what am I gravitating more towards, as I said earlier? Am I living from this is all going to work out. It's going to be awesome, which generates a feeling of ease and relaxation in the moment, which for an athlete is the precursor to better performance. Yeah. And so it becomes self-fulfilling that way. Conversely, if I'm concerned about a future, then in present time, I'm going to have tension and stress, which changes my biomechanics, which is an athlete who typically does well when they're relaxed, means I'm going to have a compromised result which is equally self-fulfilling. So you start to see, yeah. regardless of what you're focused on, it's freaking powerful. Yep. If I think that it all works out, then in present time, I tend to be in a state of ease, which then tends to fulfill on a good outcome. If I'm worried that it's not going to work out, then I'm in a state of dis-ease, and that equally tends to fulfill on the tension and the angst that I've got in my body, which doesn't allow me to perform freely. Yeah, that's so powerful. And I mean, I don't know if you're over if you're all over this situation or not, but someone like it, obviously him being Australian, it really intrigues me. But someone like a Ben Simmons, it, to me, it's super interesting to see what work like that would be able, like what effect that would have on someone like Ben Simmons at the moment, who is obviously an extremely good athlete and basketball player, but is in what seems like a serious mental slump and and kind of playing far too much on his own. On okay, his own, yeah, I'm not familiar. Head, yeah. I haven't seen what he's doing or not doing. Right. But yeah, it, it, that's the thing. I didn't grow up playing basketball. I certainly didn't play out playing baseball, and yet I've worked with God knows how many major league baseball players. I mm. didn't ride horses. I helped one of my show jumpers get a gold. You know, it's like I, it, it's irrelevant to what they're doing because it's yep. all what's going on between the ears, and that's why. For me, particularly, it's so fulfilling to be able to help people from all walks of life because when you understand the mechanics of how the mind works and what it means to be human and that we're by design wired to try and survive, once you can overcome that, then you're just free. Unreal. Mate, I'm very conscious of your time. I've just got one more, one more sure, question for you yeah. if, uh, if that suits you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Things like, let's say, meditation, affirmations, all that type of stuff, obviously, are of benefit for people in certain situations and whatnot, I've often heard you speak about how, you know, although people may feel like they're, you know, <clears throat> mentally in a really good place and they're doing X, Y, and Z, whether it be meditation, uh, journaling and ice baths and all the rest of it and whatever it may be, yeah. um, the fact that they are having to do that on a daily basis in order to feel good is still meaning that they're at a level of dis-ease or they're not at their natural state. So for someone like yourself, who has obviously yeah. done a lot of this work and, and teaches this and, and helps people with that. I'm intrigued to hear like what type of things you do, if any, on a daily or weekly basis in order to continue to stay that level of self-awareness and, and work through th blocks or things that may come up for you if you are doing forms of meditation and whatnot. Like what does a, a kind of typical day look like for you in that regard? Sure. Um I mean, I do all the above to varying degrees. I don't like task master myself in terms of like, I have to do this and got to do that because that would be coming from that state of dis-ease. The way I look at it is, you know, if people can pay attention to why are you doing something, right? That's the underlying intentionality that drives behavior. So if somebody's meditating, using affirmations, working out because there's some underlying agenda you know, in lay terms, well, I'm doing this because, then mm -hmm. you've got to look at what's the because, right? So if somebody, for example, is going to the gym because they feel that they're overweight, they're out of shape, and they're fat, 
That seems like a good choice and an appropriate behavior for the current condition they're in, but it's probably not going to be sustained or they're going to revert back to the thing they're trying to get away from because the mechanism they're using is they're being driven by judgment, right? They're saying, I am something that I don't want, so I'm going to try and do something to get rid of that. So then they're in conflict with themselves. So I invite people to look at, are you trying to get away from something or are you trying to work towards something? So for me personally, I'm not trying to avoid anything, get away from something. I'm just taking care of, and most of my behaviors are, I'm taking care of my physicality, my machinery. Not because I want people to think I'm cool, I look sexy, I've got a six pack and people will like me or... It's just I am, through my own perceived self-worth, I make choices that are commensurate with somebody who values themselves, right? So if you look at something more objective like a car, if somebody has a car they couldn't give a shit about, then they probably haven't changed the oil for months, maybe years. The tire pressure might be off. The inside might have old wrappers, Chinese cold takeaway food. Who knows what's in there? because they're not perceiving that particular object with any sense of worth. And so there isn't the associated TLC that would go with that, right? Taking care of it. So for me, the most pivotal part of any kind of daily routine, if it's going to be one, sustainable, two, impactful, it has to be based in genuine self-worth. Yeah. Otherwise, people are choosing behaviors trying to compensate for a deeper feeling of lack. And that yeah. can never be fulfilled. You might get glimpses. You might lose a bit of weight, feel sexier for a minute, and then you feel good about yourself. But it's like whack-a-mole, you know, where something will pop up in another area of your life. It's like you feel good about your body, but now somebody else got the promotion at work and you did and you're like, fuck, you know, I knew I wasn't doing good enough. And now they... Yeah. Focus all their attention on trying to become better at work and then their health gets compromised. You know, so yeah. it's like I'm the center of my universe and my state of being as I relate to myself is it's unfuckable with, right? Like who I am is at its very deepest core. It's, it's a, expression of truth for me it's not something that varies Mm -hmm. then around me my health my body my relationships my wealth my business those all will oscillate and go through cycles most people have it the other way around where internally at the deepest level they don't have a sort of sense of self-worth that is based in true fortitude and Mm -hmm. so they're trying to manage the circumstances of their life to yeah, garner yeah. that. Yeah. And that's futile and exhausting. But if I am this pillar of consistency in the way that I have my qualities and my values of freedom, of love, of peace, of worth, yep. and I function from that place, then not only do I tend to get better outcomes, but if I, for example, have a slow day, I'm tired from travel. I don't have any internal dialogue of disdain or self-abuse that I didn't do something. It's just I'm present with the circumstances of my life. I've traveled across country. I've been speaking to audiences. I've worked with clients, and I'm a little tired physiologically. So rather than berating myself that, oh, you didn't work out, you've got to meditate, you've got to do this, it's like, no, how about you put your feet up, take a nap? Or maybe in this case, I would lie under a red light as a form of you know, stacking yeah. both rest, but with something that I know is good for me. So that's my invitation to people is to really look at what's the underlying intention. Are you trying to compensate for something that you feel is an inadequacy that is really based in judgment? Or are you genuinely curious to explore your potential and your capacity as a human being out of the true joy of exploring what it means to be you? That's epic. Mate, uh, Peter, I've absolutely fucking loved this conversation and I genuinely could just sit here and just chat with you all day, um, which unfortunately you've got shit to do and so have <laughs> I, so that's not going to happen. But, um, yeah. mate, I appreciate your time. Are you coming to Australia anytime soon? Um, 
I don't know. I'd love to. Uh, I tend to be in a position now where I'm not such a huge fan of travel, so it tends to have yeah. to be something that's an invitation. I did just get an invitation to come and speak in New Zealand, um, so we'll see if that pans out. But um, yeah, I tend to sort of my my travel tends to be dictated by invitations and opportunities to make a difference. Yeah. So um, I'd love to. I, I lived in Sydney for a couple of years. Two of my favorite. Yeah. happiest years of my life we had a lot of fun so um it'd be great to get down there again sometime brilliant well we might see what we can do try to organize something yeah. um yeah all right mate thanks yeah. thanks so much and for everyone who has tuned into this episode whether it's uh, whether you're listening to it or watching it um firstly we really appreciate it and secondly if you've taken some value we'd love for you to take a screenshot of this episode share on your social media tag myself tag peter keep up with his great work and check out all his other extremely valuable content and um hopefully we we, uh, we get to chat again at some point, mate, and, and maybe even see you in Australia. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Danny. Thank Appreciate you, mate. it. Welcome to the Fitness and Lifestyle Podcast. I'm your host, Danny Kennedy, and I'm here to help you become the very best version of yourself. 